All right, folks. We are a couple minutes past the top of the hour, so I'm going to get us started. Um, realizing that some folks may join as we dive in here, but we've got a lot to cover today and want to make sure that we get great use of our hour together. I'm Carly Strauss, and for the past year, I've served on the consulting team that manages the day-to-day -day operations of the Safety Respect Equity Coalition. On behalf of the coalition's leadership, I want to thank you all for being here today for this webinar on education and training. Um, this webinar is the last one in our series that focuses deeply on various elements of the coalition's standards, um, and I want to say a huge thank you to our speakers today, Fran Zeppler, Charlene Seidel, and Amy Martizan. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping logistical items. We are recording this session, and slides in the recording will be available online this week. Um, we do want to ask that anyone who's not speaking, please mute yourself, just so we can keep background noise at a minimum here. Um, we also know that there's going to be a lot of information today, and some of you may have questions. Um, so if you have any questions during the presentation, please go ahead and throw them in the chat, um, and we will ask them at, at the top of Q&A at the end. If you would like to ask a question anonymously, please feel free to chat it directly to me, Carly Strauss, and I'll be able to ask that anonymously for you. Um, finally, I just want to share a few words on the coalition's path to this point for those of you who may be a little bit newer to our work. The Safety Respect Equity Coalition is a group of more than 110 Jewish organizations across the country who have come together to reduce gender discrimination and sexual harassment in our community. These organizations are spread from coast to coast and vary greatly in size. They include national organizations and movements, funders, JCCs, individual congregations, Jewish social service agencies, and many others. The coalition's work is, or goal is to bring all of this great work together under one banner. We want to serve as a catalyst, a convener, and a clearinghouse to lift up good work that's already happening and support new solutions in areas where our members are finding challenges. Our goal is threefold, universal leadership commitment, organizational change, and culture shift across the entire Jewish world. We're so grateful to have all of you on this journey with us, and today I'm excited to introduce our speakers who will lead us in conversation about education and training. First up, Fran Zeppler, who is the president of Zeppler & Associates. For 30 years, Fran has advised employers on the essential actions necessary to provide employees with safe, fair, and respectful workplaces. She is a seasoned employment investigator, consultant, and trainer who has worked in every sector, private, public, nonprofit, corporate, healthcare, education, and NGOs. Fran, we're so excited to have you here. Um, our next two speakers are some of your peers in the coalition. Charlene Seidel is the Executive Vice President of the Lifeshack Foundation, where she has designed a number of innovative programs, oversees their grant making, and supports their strategy development. We're honored to have Charlene as a member of our coalition's advisory board, and so happy to have her here today to share about the training that she's helped provide for the Lifeshack Foundation staff. Amy Martizan is the Associate Vice President of Strategic Human Resources at Hillel International, and also a member of our coalition's leadership group. At Hillel, she provides HR support to Hill professionals across North America and brings a, over a decade of experience in HR and has deep expertise in building HR practices for large multi-site companies and organizations. Amy, thank you so much for being here to share about the education and training that you've helped to kick off at Hillel. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Fran. Thank you, Carly. I'm thrilled to be here today. Just a heads up for participants on this webinar, I have a lot of material to cover um, and I made the decision to uh, give you a lot and go fast because I know you're going to be able to come back and listen to the tape and also the slides. Uh, but we have a lot to cover and I'll move pretty quickly. Feel free to send Carly your questions. So there's a lot to talk about when we talk about training our people in our organizations around organizational culture, climate, uh, compliance, the law. And what I'm going to do is lay out some different models and then advocate for several key components of that training. If I were to boil it down, and I guess I did on this slide, 
What we need to do is to tell our employees not just what unhelpful behavior is, but what helpful behavior is and why it happens. What are the things that go on between people in the workplace that degrade the work environment? And what are the things that really make the work environment uh, excel? We need to talk to people about the outcomes of their behavior and the choices they can make and also give them tools to behave in different ways. We need to let people know where they can go to get help, but also how they can help others uh, so that we focus on things like active bystanding. I've spent a lot of time in the last few years talking to people about how they can respond in the moment. Uh, everything from taking a breath to learning the words that are going to be effective in conveying uh, their feelings and response to people. We talk a lot about feedback and also how they can contribute to a culture of respect. Supervisory training requires a higher order of content. Because supervisors are the legal gatekeepers for organizations, we have to impress upon them that they have certain obligations when they become aware of a problem. Although they do have obligations uh, legally, I think we also need to talk to them about their cultural obligations to maintain and support a healthy culture. We need to talk to them about what retaliation looks like, but we also need to talk to them about how to let employees know that they care so they'll be trusted and people will come to them with problems. And finally, how to, on a day-to-day -day basis, make employees perceive that they will be treated fairly and feel respected. I wanna talk briefly before we go into organizational training about training for boards of nonprofits. These, these training sessions are often compressed and they're very important. As I have spent uh, time over the years training boards, I've come to understand what it is that they need to hear to get engaged on the topic of culture, respect, uh, anti-harassment, and, uh, and uh, appropriate governance. And most importantly, I think they need to hear why culture is their job uh, and, and their unique role in stewarding the culture every time they make a decision, every time they make a hire, every time they uh, support a policy. And so we're talking to them about that role in establishing and maintaining culture. Because uh, boards interact with staff on a regular basis. And because we have policies and practices that assure our staff that they're going to be treated well, respectfully, and without uh, abuse or harassment, we need to make sure our board understands their role in establishing that behavior and talk to them about the importance of treating staff with respect. We need to talk to them about their policies and how those policies are enforced and what it is that they should do as a board member if somebody comes to them. Because we are legally required to have what we call bypass, in other words, if somebody has a complaint, for instance, about an executive director, there needs to be some place else those individuals can go to file a complaint. We need to make the board aware that someone on their board is going to have to be the person who's going to receive and handle that complaint and the importance of that person having competence to do so. And finally, we need to challenge boards to think in advance about what they will do if a fellow board member engages in misconduct. In as with all training, boards respond very well to hypothetical situations and scenarios that challenge them to think about what they would do uh, in different situations. And we'll talk about the importance and the content of those scenarios and, and hypotheticals in just a few moments. So before I go into specifics on training, let's be clear that there's been a lot of examination specifically of training around the prevention of harassment and discrimination in the workplace. The 2016 EEOC Select Committee on Harassment uh, made some pretty strong findings and recommendations around training. And what they found is that the harassment training that's been done traditionally and continues to be done, that focuses on what the law says, and the requirements uh, that the law has and how to comply with them. Uh, while it can be useful to educate people about what shouldn't be happening in the workplace, it doesn't appear to actually have a preventative effect. No one has been able to demonstrate empirically that telling people about the law and their obligations under the law, how to report, how to, um, how to prevent uh, th their rights and responsibilities has prevented a single incident of harassment. 
What has been shown is that if people come into training with biases, particularly gender biases, that this kind of training can actually amplify uh, those pre-existing biases. Because of this, the select committee recommended uh, turning the lens on training and instead doing focus, training focused on what people should be doing and what the benefits of civility are focused on helping people understand how they can make a difference in their workplace by being an active bystander and by always having training as part of a comprehensive strategy to create robust and respectful work environments. The other thing, and I will say from my 30 years of experience doing training, is that there needs to be visible vocal participation and support by leadership of the content of the training, not just the training itself. This means that the first people in any organization to go through the training should be the most senior leadership. Now we are in an environment where we have some tension. California, New York, Connecticut, Maine, New Jersey, Illinois, and I'm sure that by the end of the year, the list will be longer, uh, have responded to Me Too by passing legislation requiring sexual harassment training. And you'll notice there's an asterisk on this slide. And that's because sexual harassment is only one form of unlawful harassment that are, that's prohibited by federal and state law in these states. In other words, the training requirement is around sexual harassment, but we also have to recognize that if we only focus on sexual harassment, we obscure things like racial harassment, ethnic harassment, religious harassment, harassment based on sexual orientation or sexual identity. Uh, uh, so uh, I want to caution uh, folks that if, although we are required to do sexual harassment training, if we only do sexual harassment training, we are tacitly suggesting that there is a hierarchy of importance and unlawful behavior, and that this particular kind of unlawful behavior is more serious than others. I don't think that's any of our intentions, and there is nothing in the law that prohibits including all forms of protected class harassment. The training that is mandated is compliance training. The training I've already told you doesn't have any research supporting its effectiveness. And this is just an unfortunate tension between the good intentions of our public policymakers and the academic and field research that has been done on the effectiveness of the training. So in order to be compliant in those states, uh, you have certain things you must include in your training. And that's included on this slide, and I'm just gonna really quickly run through it. What it means that you need to tell people that you have a policy and what that policy is. You need to define harassment. You need to let supervisors know what their responsibilities are and go over the examples of uh, specific behavior. Uh, you need to tell people how to report harassment. You need to discuss the uh, organizational consequences such as discipline and discharge that can happen. Uh, if people engage in harassment, you need to have some cases, talk about what happens when people report and how an investigation is done. You need to talk, tell people that they have a right to be not uh, free from retaliation and what retaliation is. And you need to let people know the charging agencies like the EEOC and state agencies that they can go to, to file a complaint if their employer fails to comply with the law. Essentially, what we tell people is that their employer is responsible to provide them with an environment free of harassment, that knowledge by supervisors is imputed to the organization and supervisors must bring it to the organization, and then describe what will happen when they complain. Um, this, is, this is your basic employee anti-harassment training. In addition, supervisors must be told what their obligations are, that they cannot keep confidentiality when some somebody reports, even if it's requested, what steps they need to take to document uh, an employee complaint, how to work with human resources if there is a human resources, and the importance of their setting the tone and responding to lower level behaviors. Folks, this is the basic. If you have a limited time and limited budget to do training, this is what your state's law is likely to ultimately require. This is sort of core training. Again, I think we have to keep our eye on the prize and recognize that this is checking the box training. This is training to do what the court would expect us to do, what the state would expect us to do. 
Um, but I want to propose to you that we have a much higher ambition than that, that we actually take steps that are shown to make a robust and real difference in our work environment. And I'm going to talk about the quality of that training. And what we have to do is we have to look to research. There is a huge and, and, and rich body of research out there that says that we can explain to our employees and to our supervisors and to our leaders that having a work environment that is safe and respectful and fair actually creates a better day-to-day -day experience for them. It allows them to do their work in a way that, uh, that will make them feel good. It will create a positive association with the workplace and work will become a positive in their life rather than a neutral or maybe even a negative. Some of the places I would point you would be Christine Porath's rich and important work on civility and individual productivity, uh, Amy Edmondson's work on psychological safety and organizational performance, Deborah Rupp writing about workplace fairness and how it contributes to people staying, being loyal and being productive, and um, Amy David's, I'm sorry, Susan David's work on emotional agility and leadership. Some other work you might turn to would be Paul Mashanko's work on the neuroscience of respect and Paul Zach's work on the neuroscience of trust. By pulling in a broader performance-based approach to respect, safety, and fairness, we engage people intellectually and with, they recognize that this training program is there to make their lives better, to make them more productive, to make their organizations happier places. And we get their attention in ways we don't when we're citing a lot of law. Um, so when we design these trainings, there are several things that are important. Uh, we want to engage people in a positive way. And when we do that, and when we create content they can relate to, uh, we find that people have a higher level of learning and retention. Uh, compared to what people recollect about compliance training six weeks later and what people recollect about respectful workplace training six weeks later, uh, the respectful content is retained about twice as well. We also have to remember that most people don't believe they will hurt uh, others. And so if we approach people as potential bad actors and tell them not to behave badly, they're going to think we're talking to somebody else. But if we approach people and say, you can make your workplace better, most people will engage with that and believe that. Um, they also want to believe they're important to their employer, so the tone of our training is important. So um, we want to create a shared understanding of how people can demonstrate respect and civility and the emotional, organizational, and psychological benefits of each. People really like to talk about the behaviors that make them feel valued in the workplace, things that their leaders can do, things that they can do. And when you engage them on that and they share their opinions with one another, you begin to actually affect the culture during the training session. And so we create a baseline for acceptable behavior by engaging in that shared understanding. So how do we do that? What we need to do is we need to attach to human learning principles by giving people things that they can remember really well. We can give them models uh, of respect. We can give them scripts uh, so that if somebody engages in behavior that makes them uncomfortable, different ways they can say it. If they want to be an active bystander, how do you say to somebody that their behavior is a problem without insulting or offending them or triggering defensiveness? How do people give each other feedback and so what are some positive ways to do that? For supervisors, when somebody tells you, I want to tell you something, but I don't want you to do anything, what are the best words to use? Documents are helpful as well. Things that people can turn to when they're facing a, a situation to recall what they learned in the training. Structures and, um, and uh, such as a, a coaching model can be helpful and goals. Tools help turn training into reality. Once we introduce those tools, then we have to teach people how to use them. So whether it is a feedback model or a coaching model or different ways of being an active bystander in the classroom, we need to give people a chance to practice those. This is a risk-free environment in which somebody can make mistakes or try something new. 
and it allows them to figure out when this really happens in real life, what's going to be my challenge? How am I going to provide feedback in the moment? How am I going to coach an employee whose behavior is a problem? So allowing the time and the interactivity to do that is really important. So now I want to turn to content and I'm going to again moving pretty fast. Um, every training should have case studies, hypotheticals, scenarios, and there are some important things to think about when you design these or you accept them from a training vendor. And that is that they need to be both plausible and resolvable. You don't want the distraction of somebody saying, well, that would never happen here. And that's why it's important that you review your case studies carefully. Even something like having a name that matches up with a name of somebody in the organization can distract from the substance. Um, so if you're in a, um, if you're in a, uh, a nonprofit service organization, you're not going to have scenarios that you would have in an executive suite, and you're not going to have the ones that you would have uh, on a shop floor. So it is important to also think about what your norms and challenges are. If you are in an organization with limited diversity, for instance, you might want to build a case study about the isolation of somebody who is the only person of a particular type. You have to be very honest with yourself as to whether there are subtle power dynamics within your organization. Build those into your case studies so that if you have a situation where, you're, where an employee is made uncomfortable by a supervisor in a scenario, you can then facilitate some discussions about why that might be a tough discussion. But even more, why senior staff may be more inclined to speak up than junior staff. Um, we also want to know if uh, in professional firms where you have people sort of uh, at the, uh, in professional roles and then you have admin or back office employees, are there power status differences there? And then you also want to build case studies around plausible social environments. A lot of things that happen in the workplace that create challenges happen outside the normal social boundaries, at conferences, after work, at lunch. Uh, when people are at each other's uh, homes. And it's important to recognize that when supervisors are socializing with employees, organizations have a responsibility to, uh, to scrutinize and think about the impact of those interactions. Uh, liability doesn't leave just because it's not between your four walls. I also want to note that when you create scenarios, they have to be what I call sufficiently resolvable. You don't want to end up in a situation where everybody's shrugging their shoulders and says, nobody knows what the solution is here. You want to have some ideas about good ways to solve the problem. Another thing that I recommend is that at least part of the, tr the training involves some degree of personal sharing. A really good example is when I teach about the concept of fairness to supervisors. I tell people to turn to the person next to them and spend three minutes describing a time they were treated unfairly at work. Um, and I usually ask them to talk about how it felt and how they responded. In those three minutes, the room usually turns from a dull, a dull uh, uh, buzz to a roar as people recall and connect with the emotion they felt of being treated unfairly. This gives us an opportunity both to connect with people's real emotions and have people identify with how important it is to create fairness for their employees. When you do this, of course, you always want to provide an apt, opt out or alternate. If they don't want to, if they don't feel comfortable talking about a situation at work, they can talk about a personal situation, et cetera. Um, I'm going to um, sort of uh, tout a continuum approach um, because we do, in some cases, uh, need to include compliance training. Uh, in our training, I think it's really important to start out talking about good behavior and move in a uh, classical way uh, from really great behavior to behavior that's not so great to behavior that's really problematic. And I'm going to uh, just move right along here and show you the continuum that I use in my training, where we spend the first time part of our training talking about respect. And before we talk about unlawful behavior, we talk about behavior that isn't unlawful but degrades the organization. We spend time talking about uncivil or rude behavior, a neurotoxin that affects people in substantial ways, and about workplace bullying, 
which has terrible sequelae, including complex post-traumatic stress disorder. By talking about these shades of behavior, we put protected class harassment in context, but we also speak to people who are experiencing behavior that may not rise to the level of violating the law, but it may be affecting their lives, and also cautioning people that if they engage in this behavior, uh, it creates, uh, it can degrade the work environment and even result in consequences for them. Bystander and ally skills are really important. We need to include that as well, explaining to people what an active bystander is and really emphasizing uh, safety. Because we are not out in the community talking about being a bystander and ally in, uh, in hate crimes, for instance, we do have to acknowledge that there are our power, status, and authority uh, dynamics in the workplace that really will affect their choice on how to be a bystander. Are they, can they only just support someone they see uh, being treated poorly? Or can they disrupt the behavior? Can they provide feedback? And um, they, can they confront bits of the behavior? And once again, this is a place where we really need to give people an opportunity to practice stepping up and stepping in. We also want to have people uh, practice conversations in the moment. This is where I hear from people, uh, employees, this is what they really want. What do you say in the moment? And so we ask people to role play those situations. I always find it's a really good conversation starter to say to employees, if you were engaging behavior that annoyed or bugged your coworker, would you rather they report it or tell you? 100% of people say they'd rather that the person tells them. So that provides them some incentive to say, well, let's start talking about how we provide feedback to one another. Um, uh, and then I just wanna say that when we're doing this kind of skill building, um, we are always letting people know that they are never required to be an active bystander and they are never required to provide somebody feedback. We always want to let them know that there is a supportive, uh, 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 structure for them to go to. They can go to any manager or supervisor. They can go to HR. And then supervisors are important. When I testified before the EEOC in 2016, I said if I had nine, if I had a dollar to spend to create healthy organizations, I'd spend 99 cents on supervisors. Supervisors know what need to know what to say in the moment when somebody comes to them with a complaint. What they say or do is a profound determinant of whether a year from now that person will be suing or staying. Not only do they know what to do legally, they need to know what to do psychologically. And very often supervisors don't have the best instincts about what to say um, and say things that make people immediately break trust with the organization. So this is a very specific way to talk about confirming that the employee is taking, being taken seriously, not trying to investigate or interrogate, demonstrating emotional intelligence. And this is about scripting and practicing. Here is an example of what we tell our supervisors. Don't ask closed-ended questions, but instead ask open-ended questions to promote employee storytelling. Don't ask employees why they did something or why they didn't do something. That's going to make them feel as though you're doubting or questioning their judgment. Don't rush to solve the problem until you understand it and let the person uh, talk 90%. Uh, when we put people into role plays, we have people do this for seven minutes listening to an employee complaint. And people say, I started to solve the problem after three minutes. So this becomes very challenging for people. And when they recognize it's challenging for them, they're motivated to work on it. We also need to remind people what retaliation is and give broad examples that are not limited to firing, um, demoting, but instead are things like shunning or cutting people off. We need to equip our people to understand how to prevent retaliation and how to recognize it. And finally, after the training, make sure you cement the learning. Uh, give people some weekly discussion questions that supervisors can use in their work teams. Uh, suggest that there be a book club to read certain books afterwards and discuss them. Make sure that you are providing people with tools to keep the learning alive. That's what I've got for you today. And, um, and I um, appreciate uh, your sticking with me as I went through this very fast. Um, I want to introduce or pass the baton here to Charlene, who's going to talk about the experience in her organization doing training, and she'll be followed by, uh, by Amy Martison, who's going to uh, do the same. Thank you, Fran. 
hi everybody. Hi from San Diego. Hopefully you can see me on the screen. Um, wow, Fran, that was an incredible and robust um, uh, presentation. I know I was taking copious notes and it kind of leads to the first thing that I wanted to say, which is that for, I, I'm always somewhat uncomfortable as, as some of our team can share and others in presenting a case study like this because I don't want it to sound like we've figured something out, that we've checked it off a list, that we're done. On the contrary, I want to share, and I'm honored to share, what we've done here at Leash Tag, or what, we've, um, what we're in the process of, but really, really emphasize that this is a dynamic process, it's an iterative process, it's one that we're adjusting daily, weekly, as we learn more things. I know that I learned from Fran's presentation it affirmed some of the tools and strategies that we used, and I'm going to um, be asking our teams to implement some of the, the tools and strategies that we didn't think of. So that was really, really helpful. Um, for those of you who don't know much about Leash Tag, I'll quickly say that we are a both an operating and a grant making foundation, which means that we have diversity on our team in many different ways. First of all, in terms of functional area, we have um, direct program staff. We have staff that are responsible for property and facilities management. We own a 67 acre property in Southern California that you're all invited to. Um, we have grant making staff and we have administrative staff. That diversity of staff also means that we have a very wide range of age, background, culture, gender identity, context, and we sort of started to discuss what we were going to do within that framework. So the way that we kind of approached this was, of course, you know, we'd, be, we'd been sort of talking about it informally, gathered a small group um, of people from multiple teams, but a small group that could really be a thought group as to what would be the best strategy to begin to share more formally um, how we build and how we affirm and how we continue to provide the best possible work culture and organizational culture that our team will um, feel, of course, um, safe, respected, equitably treated, but also one that they really feel ownership, that they don't feel scared or that they're working, walking on eggshells, that they feel a culture that they feel they thrive and do their best. Um, so from the beginning, we spoke about, or as we planned this, we spoke about a series, which is what I'm going to share with you. We have, we've had now three different um, gatherings, and we're in the process now of um, processing some of the results through a small task force, but I'll get there um, in a minute. Um, I think it's important to say that I thought it was important as the senior professional in the organization to set the tone for this. I actually sent the explanatory note giving the background of what we were doing, why we were offering this series, why we were requiring attendance from everybody across our staff, and I'll share more about that in a minute. Um, why this was important to us, why we thought it should be important to them, and as the as the leader of the organization, how we all felt a common sense of accountability for this. And a real sense of, I, I, I don't exactly remember what was in that note, but I know that I think what, what I tried at least to emphasize is our obligations as an organization to our employees in many, many different ways. We spend so much time talking about our employees' obligations to us, their responsibility to us, and we have deep, deep, deep responsibility to our team. We included everybody on the team um, to give you a sense of that diversity. We have um, a few members, a few wonderful members of our team who are not English speakers. They speak um, Spanish and we had um, simultaneous translation happening for them. Um, for everybody from the woman that cleans our offices um, to the people that are taking care of our landscape to um, myself um, and the entire gamut in between. We started with um, the legal trainings. We, we approached it as what do we have to do? What is really the bare minimum? 
We had a separate legal trainings for supervisors and non-supervisors. I think they were about two hours each, but it was important to emphasize again that this is the bare minimum of what we have to do um, to be legal. I was much more interested in the second part of their series, which was a um, three hour facilitated discussion facilitated by a team member who's kind of an inside outside. She's, um, she's here for two years as sort of a Jewish scholar in residence and she's also a skilled facilitator. Um, her name is Rabbi Chaya Gilboa. She facilitated a, a three hour discussion about what do we want to do? What are our highest standards? What reflects our organizational culture the best? What does safety, respect, and equity mean to the Leash Tag Foundation? What did it mean to the Leash Tags? What does it mean as, our, as part of our identity as a Jewish foundation? What does it mean in terms of us being a very diverse work environment? We use some of the tools and strategies that Fran mentioned around um, the discussion, um, discussion questions and discussing amongst themselves in pairs. We use some case studies. I think one of the most effective things that we did is that we asked people to write down in various ways on post-its that then kind of got aggregated at different times. When have we been um, a target or a victim of unsafe or disrespectful or uncivil behavior? Um, in any kind of an environment. We then really wanted to also everybody to sort of shift their mindset and think about when have we been a perpetrator inadvertently off, you know, in general, but when have we been, when have we inadvertently um, perpetuated some kind of unsafe, disrespectful or uncivil be behavior. Um, and then we spoke about when have we been a bystander and what or we contributed about when we have been a bystander. We all put those um, examples or those thoughts into a, a hat or a bowl and then um, everybody took a note out and they read from somebody else's anonymous um, note. So it was important to us that we all wore the hats of target slash victim, um, perpetrator, and bystander because as a diaper as a team we all do wear those hats always none of us is immune to any of those hats um, we then proceeded into a discussion of the organizational values the elements of work culture the best practices the good practices that would re reflect basically the leash tag kind of culture we talked about everything from hugging and how it's handled in a, in a workplace where we are proud to be familial, but also recognize maybe some of the downsides of that. We spoke about it in the terms of maybe some special code or words we say to each other as bystanders. All kinds of different um, ideas were shared and written on a board um, to be, and then kind of prioritized as a group. Um, and I'm happy to answer more questions offline about the specifics of the process, but um, those were then aggregated. It was a very open discussion. We didn't do any kind of um, filtering of ideas. We encouraged people to share ideas um, in a productive way um, with the intent to kind of um, really facilitate an open discussion um, and then have a process by which we would narrow down some of these ideas and um, or at least highlight where there, there was commonality and then um, figure out what does it really mean? Like what are our cultural standards? What is our code of conduct here at Leash Talk? What are our cultural team? What does it mean to be here? Um, and I think it's important to say that um, I personally and I think others on the management team tried to um, not talk as much as maybe I would. I didn't always succeed. I think we still got feedback that some of our um, senior staff um, didn't create enough space, um, myself included, for everybody to to participate. And that was really, really important feedback to receive and, and something that we're continually working to improve. Um, as, a th as the third part of our series, we were really, really fortunate to have really talented trainer Gila Benchimol. Gila um, is part of our um, Safety, Respect, and Equity Coalition. I first met Gila through a presentation that she gave to another funder group that I'm part of, which included a lot of um, 
let's just say senior leaders in the funding world um, that were not as diverse generationally um, or in any other way, and I'll leave it at that. And I just thought that she did so, so deftly and with such empathy, but also clarity, she was an incredible choice to come in. And she led a three hour session about, about the topic, about victimization, about the, all the different areas of victimization, certainly focusing on s sexual victimization, but also how um, people of color and people from um, non-conforming gender identities, et cetera, are further victim vic victimized and there becomes like um, multiple layers of marginalization and alienation. Gila also advised us internally um, about some of the structure of these sessions and also some of the next steps. So that kind of brings us to where we are now. Um, following the, this series, we, we asked for volunteers um, to create a, a task force, which um, I think actually has a meeting today. But the task force includes a wide range of people from the organization in terms of level and authority. I'm not on the task force, but um, our, everybody from our receptionist is on there to our um, manager of, of some of our programs to a vice president and so we to our human resources manager they're gonna work on what they're gonna take a look at what was contributed we also followed the open discussion that I mentioned the facilitated discussion about what do we really want to do what is the least tag way with an anonymous survey which I should have pointed out before the survey to our staff kind of tried to also supplement at least some of the um, people that may have felt that senior team was speaking too much. Um, so to give other forums for people to contribute and that was really helpful. We got some really, really good information from that. We also had a, we have a, um, an area where people can kind of submit anonymous comments into a, into a box, which again, I think I struggle a little bit with anonymity and I think some do and some don't. Um, in terms of some of this, these kinds of feedback mechanisms. And I think we're trying things, we're trying to be iterative, we're trying to be responsive and adjust as we go. When we got that feedback about senior team, you know, talking, we wanted to offer something. And, um, and is it the best way? We'll, we'll see. Um, but the task force is, uh, is, is working right now. They'll then share their recommendations and we will, um, kind of try to implement and train on a leash tag code of conduct that will be much more than the bare minimum. It'll be like, what does it really mean to be part of our leash tag team? It'll be included in orientation, employee handbooks. Our plan is to not just let it sit on the shelf. We'll do ongoing trainings about it, ongoing reminders. And I think um, we should be dusting it off you know, every year and then and re revamping it besides the trainings on how we um, on how we implement the least tag way and what it really means to be the uh, part of this organizational culture. I'm hopeful that new team members, um, new experiences will also bring ways to improve and build upon just as we adapt in, in, in other areas of our work. So um, I think I'll leave it at that, and I'm more than happy to take any questions anytime. Um, Carly has my um, contact information, um, and I'm really happy to turn it over to Amy from Halo. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Charlene. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Martison, Associate Vice President for Strategic HR for Hillel International. Um, like Charlene, we're still working to get this right. We've made a tremendous amount of progress over the last year um, in all things safety, respect, and equity, but we still have a ton of work to do. Um, we're so appreciative of the generous support of the SRE Coalition um, and the grant that they gave us to help support all of our SRE work. Um, but today I was asked to speak about training specifically. So I'm gonna focus on what we've done to train our staff, um, both at the Schusterman International Center and across our movement. So um, myself and four others actually participated in Fran Suppler's Train the Trainer in New York City last October. 
Um, we selected the three other Schusterman International Center trainers based on their facilitation skills and their portfolio. So um, Sarah Stesis is responsible for organizational development at the Schuster and Schusterman International Center. Leah Siskin Mose runs our wellness initiative and Josh Feldman is our VP for leadership development and springboard. Um, them along with myself and then Tilly Shamus, who you all know, um, who we brought in as an ex executive director um, because we felt it was really important to have field representation in our group to buy, um, to gain buy-in and because she's clearly a leader in this space. Um, so after the five of us attended Fran's Train the Trainer, um, I think we walked away with like a lot of excitement because the material was so great and we knew there was work we needed to do to Hillelify it um, and make it our own. Um, so we spent the next several months um, really learning the material, modifying it, um, and really focusing on the case studies to make them fit um, th what, what really goes on in the Hillel world. Um, in April, so several months later, um, we rolled out training for the Schusterman International Center. Um, that's approximately 150 staff members. Um, and we made it mandatory. Um, and we offered a series of in-person trainings in DC, New York, San Francisco, um, Ohio, and then we also offered a couple online options. So in total, we offered eight two-hour sessions of respectful workplace training, and then an additional eight two-hour sessions of the Leading for Respect training, and that's how we hit all 150 Schusterman International Center employees. We then switched our focus to the field. The reason we did SIC first um, was because, A, we knew they would be a little bit more forgiving and let us practice and get it right, um, and B, because we were able to make it mandatory for them. Um, so we knocked out 150 professionals, and then we switched our focus to the field. Um, Tilly actually sent a note to all executive directors um, letting them know that we are making this training available to them um, and that we aspire to 100% participation in a training such as this movement wide. So we did not say you had to participate in our training, even though we know it's the best one. Um, we just said you should participate in a training on this subject um, and we aspire to 100% participation. We did it that way because many of our Hillels are parts of federations or parts of universities um, and not necessarily standalone 501c3s. And so we wanted to allow flexibility in how they chose to participate. So last month in July, we began our roadshow. Um, we started at our new director's institute in Orlando. Um, we then moved on to train our West Coast professionals at what we call our Western Hillel's Conference in Los Angeles. Um, we trained our Israel Fellow Supervisors at their annual conference in Baltimore. Um, and we also offered several online sessions for those who either um, are in rem remote locations or um, didn't ask us to come to them. Um, thus far, we have trained 285 Hillel professionals, um, which is super exciting. Um, and we have um, eight more in-person sessions planned between now and the end of October. Um, in addition, and those are, those are going to be on site, so at a local Hillel. Um, at local Hillels across the country. So these Hillels have asked us to come to them um, and facilitate Fran's training. So we always send two facilitators. Um, we've just found that um, 
we're really able to play well off of one another. And because there's five of us trained, it, it allows us, um, based on our own geography and the geography of where the Hillel is that wants us to come, um, we've never had to say no yet. So um, that's super exciting. Um, we're also going to offer these trainings at our annual global assembly in Atlanta in December. Um, so I'm forecasting that um, we'll be well over 500 professionals trained by December. Um, that we certainly aspire to do far more than that. That's that's just about half of our entire population, which for you know a six-ish month period um, is is pretty great. Um, after every session, we ask for feedback. We do it through um, SurveyMonkey, so it's anonymous. Um, and we use that feedback to continue to really hone the training to fit um, what our professionals are asking for. I, um, I took one quote from the like thousands of pieces of feedback that we've gotten thus far that I wanted to share with you. Um, the training was thoughtfully assembled, had a logical flow with great sensitivity to the delicacy of the subject matter. The facilitators guided us with integrity and found ways to make it all relatable, and the case studies were particularly useful for this last piece. So, I mean, that's kudos to Fran for creating this training that is so feels so accessible to so many. Um, and I, I, we've just been blown away by um, the appreciation that really everyone has shown for us bringing it to them um, at Hillel. Um, so a few takeaways that I wanted to share based on our experience is that um, in-person training is way more impactful than online. So we have now offered multiple trainings online and multiple trainings in person. And far and away, the feedback is always so much better um, for those in-person sessions. Now, I, we realize, especially when we have Hillel's in rural um, random locations that we can't always do it in person and it's certainly better to deliver the content and get it to the people rather than not offering it at all online, but we always prefer to do it in person. Um, another takeaway, people are so grateful to have a common language and the tools necessary to address behaviors that fall outside of respect. Um, it's it's amazing um, how many people come up to us at the end of these programs and just say thank you or call me up after the fact and say, I told somebody, dude, that's not cool. And then they stopped that behavior. So it's, it's giving them the tools they need to be active bystanders and to, to call it like it is when they see it. Um, another takeaway, the last uh, oh, the case studies and brainstorms are by far the most meaningful parts of the training. Um, and feedback is important. We continue to tweak and hone after every session. So what's next for us at Hillel? Um, more training. Um, pretty much the entire month of September, I am in various cities across North America. Um, we also have not yet rolled out the governance training. Um, so that is really high on our priority list. Um, we wanted to get our staff trained first, but we already have requests to train our lay leaders as well. Um, we're also starting to think about the annual refreshers that we want to offer, um, plus making sure that this gets incorporated into new hire onboarding. Um, so that constantly, you know, with an influx of new professionals, they're always um, they always have access to this training and they're all speaking the same language. Um, and we're beginning to think about how to incorporate Jewish text study into our materials. Um, so that's it for us. A huge thank you to Fran for sharing um, this really powerful training with us. Um, and a thanks to all of you for listening. All right.
Amy and Charlene, thank you so much. Um, and Fran, thank you, thank you. Um, I know, at least for me, this has been hugely informative and so great to learn more about what all of you have experienced and learned and taught. Um, I know we are just about at the end of our time. We do have a couple questions that have come in via the chat. Um, so we'll see how much we can get through before we hit the end of our hour. Um, so the first one is, um, I think mostly for Fran, but any of you feel free to dive in. How do you recommend workshopping case studies where there is some gray area or no easy answer? Well, I think that it, I think that having some gray area in the case studies is important. The goal of case studies isn't necessarily to pigeonhole or name the conduct. This is harassment. This is abuse. This is disrespectful. But instead to focus on the human dimension of it. What are the options that people in that situation have to address it in the moment? What could have prevented this? Very often, um, the richest conversations we have is what allowed the situation to develop? Uh, what was going on in the culture? What were leaders doing? What were leaders not doing? What were peers doing, not doing? And so when I talk about being um, resolvable, I talk about having really clear teaching points in them. I think that when we ask people to, uh, to put uh, situations and categories, we're often asking them to make judgments that, are, that really don't matter. I have, a, I have a thing that I say to supervisors, which is leave the law to the lawyers. If you're dealing with a situation that is unprofessional, uncomfortable, disruptive, distracting, that's in your portfolio and you don't have to name it, you just have to make sure it gets addressed. And so, um, so uh, in those cases, maybe even come up with three or four alternatives for ways people could handle things. Great, thank you, Fran. Um, and since we've got one minute, one more question. Um, would you distinguish between a bystander and a term that is sort of coming into style upstander and what might be some of the distinctions there? Uh, I guess I wanna defer if anybody else wants to take that one on. Uh, if not, I think there, the language that you're using is coming a lot um, from work being done on sexual assault on college campuses and in hate crimes. And I think it's a, it's a lovely distinction um, in terms of uh, really creating an imperative to act and stepping up. Um, but I also think that we have to be really clear that in the workplace, there are issues of safety that have to be considered. And we don't want to say to people, you must step up because some people are very low in hierarchical organizations and may only be able to offer support to somebody. So I do think we want to be sensitive really in our training about all of our language. We want to avoid criminal justice language like victim and perpetrator and instead use complainant respondent. We want to avoid using labels that tell people that they're compelled to step up. Um, we, want to, uh, we want to put things in terms where our language isn't going to shut the people down, but invite people in. Great, thank you so much, Fran. Um, and those are all the questions that we've had come in at this point and also the end of our time together. So I just wanna wrap up by saying thank you, thank you, thank you to Fran, Amy, and Charlene, and also to all of you for being here with us. Um, this recording will be online next week. And in the meantime, recordings from all of the other past sessions in this webinar series are available on our safetyrespectequity.org website. So please do check them out. Um, I will also send you all an email when this recording is ready to go. So keep an eye on your inboxes for this. But thank you all for being here and have a great rest of your days. Bye. Thank you, Carly.